The first couple boss battles in Undertale aren't super serious. Toriel's just making sure you know to look both ways before crossing the street, and Papyrus just needs a playtester for his puzzle prototypes. But when Undyne shows up, the music's first impression is decidedly intimidating, perhaps the first character that kids might find genuinely scary. The sequence you just heard illustrates textbook execution of the Neapolitan chord. It starts with the normal one chord, but this next chord is not built upon a note in the song's scale. The Neapolitan chord sets its foundation on the minor two, just one piano key above the tonic home bass note. This Neapolitan chord derives its name from the 18th century composers who used it a lot in the Italian city of Naples. You may see it notated as a flat uppercase two, but it's just as often notated with a capital N. Way to get your name out there, Naples. One frequently finds this Neapolitan chord in bullfighting themes, in real life and in games, such as this 1984 Sega arcade depiction. The Neapolitan chord in Undyne's intro sets the stage for the battle to come in this metaphorical arena. The steady arpeggios that outline these chords could be considered Undyne's signature melody. On the one chord's measure, it includes a Dorian major sixth, while the Neapolitan chord holds true to the natural minor sixth. Despite this threatening exterior, even this first impression gives away hints of humor especially when measure 9 introduces a sine wave melody that resembles a theremin. You might not believe it's real, but it is an early electronic instrument that rose to prominence in the 1920s, and your hand doesn't even make contact while playing. The farther your hand strays from the upright antenna, the lower the note gets, and it's great for that spooky, Halloween-y sound. That PlayStation game, Croc, uses the theremin throughout even in levels not meant to feel like Count Chocula's lair. As a Halloween cliche, this theremin line has a silliness hinting that there may be a bit more to this character under the intimidating surface, as we will go on to discover. Still, the dominating force by far is that imposing 1 to flat 2 line, which is directly expressed on the bass, generating that sense of impending dread that the Jaws theme is good for. And here you are, hiding in the reeds, crossing your fingers that Undyne doesn't head in your direction. This Jaws association takes a new layer of meaning when Undyne attacks from underneath during the bridge chase sequence. Undyne is a fish monster after all, complete with gills and scales. One thing you see a lot in video games during this kind of tense escape sequence is an odd numbered non-standard time signature. This makes it so when you reach the end of a musical phrase, you're expecting some more beats, but it throws you into the next measure prematurely. This creates an organic sense of hurried urgency. Super Metroid's escape sequence gives you a hurried 5-4 sprint in what might otherwise be a 6-4 format. Tap along to Undertale's track Run and see if you can detect a non-standard rhythm.
trick question, it's actually in good old 4-4. So how does it manage to sound so off balance? One method was the brute force cramming of the original 3-4 Undyne melody into a 4-4 format. The source jingle operates on a count of three. One, two, three, one, two, three. But if we copy and paste this shape into a 4-4 grid, a problem arises because the third unit can't fit. See how it sticks out into the next measure? So the composer chopped off that excess baggage. Resulting in a total of 16 notes, which is most definitely divisible by 4. This 4-4 structure is further obscured by the kick and snare patterns, because they don't provide a consistent backbeat of kick, snare, kick, snare. Instead, it begins with a pair of kick snares in increments of three. So there's only four squares for the remainder of the measure. By necessity, these last two hits are afforded only two squares each, conforming to the chopped segment of the Undyne melody. This asymmetry of rhythm works well among the uneven start-stop movements while dodging all these spears along the path. But when you eventually make it to the main fight, the motif from her first impression theme is given more room to breathe, opening up the Colosseum of this duel. When you first spotted Undyne from a distance, the notes of her signature melody were presented in steady eighth notes of equal length, matching the mechanical march of her knight's armor. But as we gradually uncover Undyne's deal, some modest syncopation provides a more dynamic rhythm. Weaving back and forth in the dance of this combat track, Spear of Justice. Chord-wise, the close quarters crunch of the Jaws 1 to flat 2 is opened up to the more expansive 1 to Dorian 4 chord. This particular 1 to 4 chord change is a sequence we've come across in video game tunes elsewhere, and even recording artists like Santana lean on it, like in the song Frank Zappa has a track that pokes fun at Santana's overuse of these chords. Secret, LMAO. But one way the Spear of Justice theme shakes up these reliable chords is by key changing up just one single semitone. Pop music used to do this on the regular, especially toward the end of a song, in order to give the final chorus an exciting lift, like in Michael Jackson's Man in the Mirror. I'm looking at the man in the mirror To make the underground a better place Just look at yourself and make a Change, I'm looking at the man in the mirror. You don't see this nearly as much nowadays because it kind of became a cheap method to hold the listener's attention after the repeating choruses have long since run their course. So Spear of Justice ups the ante by executing this one semitone key change just a mere 22 seconds into the song. This shift of tonal home bass works well along with the multiple battle phases of shield deflection and later spear dodging, along with your incremental flea attempts up the bridge. And the first new melody we get beyond the core Undyne motif could be said to function as a turnaround, a chord or melody that turns us back around to the start of a phrase to repeat, or as a segue to a new section. And the last turnaround that sends us into section B is humorously extended again and again, while you're desperately deflecting wave after wave of attacks from all sides, holding your breath in hopes it finally relents. Section B offers a spruced up run-through of the Ruins theme, before touching upon the chords of the Andalusian cadence 
that descending minor keyed chord progression seen frequently on flamenco guitar. Spear of Justice actually runs through a reverse Andalusian cadence, hopping down to the five to climb back up. Speaking of Spain, this melody fragment from the Ruins theme on the horns really adds to the bullfighting energy. This corresponds to the bullfighting elements of Undyne's appearance. Her red ponytail waving in the wind evokes the red cape that matadors use to bait the bull into charging. This is done in the early phase of a bullfight, to gauge the bull's demeanor and quirks, which will inform the combat in the rounds to come. Similar to how Undyne tests you on the bridge by giving you the runaround. And with spears no less, which matadors use in the fight's middle phase so the bull's less dangerous in the rounds to come. It's very violent, and a bad deal for the bull. But everything that goes around comes back around for the sermon in the Zelda corridor at the end of the game. So if Undyne spears you into oblivion, stay determined, because even the game over theme provides encouragement through its use of the Dorian Sixth, which is basically when a minor keyed song uses a major sixth, as the game over track does. And Dorian may just be the composer's middle name, since this device is all over the soundtrack, especially in a lot of main boss themes. This major sixth in a minor keyed framework is a great indication that deep within the combative exterior, there is nonetheless a path to friendship and compassion to be had. There's one in the bridge of Toriel's battle theme. And in the backing chords of the papyrus fight. What's curious about Undyne's theme is that the initial frightening intro features both sixes. But the Spear of Justice theme uses only the major sixth. Power through the pacifist route and you'll be doing cooking activities together in no time. But how about the more uncivil route? where you mistreat every creature you come across. This playthrough has its own separate track for the Undyne fight called Battle Against a True Hero. Since you're on a warpath to wipe out the entire underground, the twist is that now Undyne is the protagonist, but your evil warpath has built so much momentum that Undyne's motif and its major sixth is nowhere to be seen. Your wrath takes center stage, delivered in full by the Eggman cadence. That natural minor progression of chords 6, 7, and then to the 1 minor triad. It's a solid go-to for villain themes, if Sonic 3's boss and mini-boss themes are any indication. This cadence serves the Asgore theme as well, since at that point he's kind of the game's central antagonist. But in Battle Against a True Hero, the Eggman cadence keeps pointing back to the hub of evil, you. In fact, the only melody that recurs from Spear of Justice is that Ruins theme fragment. As Undyne passes on, she may be resigned to her defeat, but she's going out in a blaze of glory as a last stand for her population, believing that with the power of friendship and contingency plans, the Ruins' collective consciousness can never be snuffed out. The green human soul may have had a brush up with Undyne, with these frying pan fire attacks right out of her kitchen, set to a curtain call of the Neapolitan baseline. This chain of influence extends to the king as well, 
when the notes of Undyne's signature melody strike violently in the fight's last gasps. Asgore taught her everything she knows, after all. But that's pretty intense. So, bring it in, guys is the medley that plays during the credits. And for the Undyne reprise, it doesn't even set it up with a segue. The track comes to a stop, and then launches into this disarming Tetrisy rendition of Undyne's true jingle. It even switches up the drum beats, somewhat evoking the bridge chase rhythms. The last thing you may not have known about Undyne the Undying is that she knows music theory, and not only plays but teaches piano, the instrument featured in many of her theme songs. And her relationship with Alphys might seem imbalanced, what with all the self-insert fanfics, but one listen of Undyne's piano performance of the Alphys theme reveals her to be just as big a stan, set to 5-4 time. <laughs> 